Hey there, Father Michael here. A few days ago, I received word that my long-term friend, my second mom, Virginia, had passed away peacefully at the nursing home in Oklahoma where, where she had lived for nearly the last 10 years. When I first moved here to the state 25 years ago, she and her daughter, Sharon, were really among my very first friends. We all volunteered at a free clinic um, down at St. Patrick's Church um, at the time. And so I got to interact with both Virginia and Sharon uh, a couple days a week. Virginia, like I said, became like a second mom to me. And I remember one time I was uh, in the clinic and I was looking for something, bandages or I don't know, something in the, in the storage closet. And Virginia came in looking for me and she, she shouted into the closet, Michael, are you in the closet? And then she realized that she'd said something kind of funny. And she added, never mind, I know you're not. And then she just cracked herself up. <laughs> she laughed all morning about that little uh, exchange. Uh, and it's a story that she and I referred to often enough over the past 25 years. Virginia fell and broke her neck when she was in her late 80s. And as a result, had to wear one of those metal halos around her head for the rest of her life. She had heart issues and had been on a lot of medication for decades. She was 99 when she passed. She was still mentally sharp. She had also lost her only daughter, Sharon, my friend, to heart disease 20 years ago. And I was asked to sing at her funeral, which of course I did. Through all of that, through all of the challenges, I never once heard Virginia bitch about anything. Literally never. Not one complaint about her struggles, about her sorrows, about the pain of losing a child, about her physical challenges and discomfort. There was absolutely no self-pity because she trusted in God. She was a good Methodist, but she attended my ordination to priesthood as my surrogate mom. She was always so proud of absolutely everything that I did, whether it was, you know, dancing with Fort Wayne Ballet and the Nutcracker or performing music or ministering as a priest and pastor. She and I just spoke about three weeks ago by phone and she sounded like she had always sounded upbeat and grateful and faithful to her God, supportive, generous with her praise of me and gratitude for having me in her life and all of that. She had also managed at the nursing home to somehow sweet talk the Roman Catholic priest into giving her communion when he made his rounds, which, you know, for those of you who know, it's not allowed by the Roman rules. Um, but nonetheless, the priest was open enough to see that this was truly a holy woman. A woman who was able to keep her focus completely on God and just keep moving ahead. And man, it, it, is that a lesson I need or what? I asked myself. I remember in high school, 
which was basically a shit show. But anyway, I remember one thing that I took out of that whole three year period in high school driver's education class, the instructor told us that when we're driving on the road, we should never ever look at that yellow line that divides the two lanes. Because if we look at that yellow line and we focus on that, then we're going to drift into that line and we're gonna have a head-on collision. Well, you know me, I've tested that a few times. It is certainly true. It's true in other situations as well. When I used to go canoeing uh, through the rapids uh, or biking through narrow spaces uh, on trails, you know, between trees and rocks and at the edge of a cliff, uh, whatnot, I remembered that sage piece of advice from high school, probably the only sage advice I got. If I focused on the rocks, I hit them. If I focused on a bump that I was hoping wasn't going to throw me off my bike, yep, I hit that bump. But if I focused on the narrow passage between those obstacles, I made it through. There's a name for that. It's called target fixation. Target fixation is simply a term that explains the truth that our bodies, our physical bodies, tend to gravitate toward whatever it is that we are staring at. Whatever we're concentrating on, that's the way the body goes. Which is why I kept hitting those rocks and kept getting stuck in narrow straits uh, while biking. It's why I kept sinking my canoe when I was going down the rapids. If on the other hand, I focused and I concentrated instead farther ahead beyond the point of where the obstacles were, aware of those obstacles to be sure, but not staring directly at them, then I could safely navigate through or around them. After a lot of falls and crashes and a few near drowning misadventures, I began to trust this truth. Rather than nervously approaching a situation that was potentially risky, I forced myself to look straight ahead. And I was able to successfully avoid a lot of unpleasantness. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, it says, O God, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So, there it is. Scripture basically is telling me the same thing but I need to keep my focus on God, not on my challenges, not on my fears, not on my obstacles, not on what could happen that would be bad. But that is so much easier said than done. Our God promises peace whenever we choose to focus on God's truth rather than on our own issues and worries. It's not that the worries and the struggles and the fears <clears throat> somehow take all the bad stuff away. No, the struggles are still there. It's just the way it goes. But instead of relying only on ourselves and our own skill sets, we take a breath and we just allow God to give us hope and strength because we're not focused on the problems, we're focused on God. That is not just the one lesson worth learning that I got from high school in that driver's ed class when I was 15. It is a lesson that my second mom, Virginia, modeled for me 
over the past 25 years. I already miss her presence in my life. And I mourn the fact that it is now officially the case that I have no mother left on this earth to guide me, to nurture, to love, to praise me, to stand by me so faithfully. But more than the sadness, I'm so grateful to have had her in my life for 25 years. Grateful for that family connection between the two of us. Grateful to have become really part of her larger family. And grateful for God having given me a living example of what living a life of faith is really all about. Mighty, loving God. We open ourselves to your divine spirit that lives within us. Help us in this moment to acknowledge you as our source and as our final destination. Help us to focus on you instead of the challenges we are currently facing. Help us to trust a little bit more in your guiding hand, your never-ending love. As we move through this life with just a little bit more faith today than we had yesterday, in gratitude, we lift up all of those people you have sent us throughout our life who have shown us things we might otherwise have missed. Further evidence of your ongoing care and nurture for each one of us. For all that this life has given us, the blessings and the challenges the laughter and the tears. We thank you. Amen. And now may the God of peace, the God of unconditional love, be with you today and with all those you love. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.